all for coming this morning uh, for this first time workshop. I also want to acknowledge the Korean Institute of Toxicology and, and thank them for sponsoring this session. They've been an outstanding sponsor of OTS over the years and, and they, took on the, uh, um, they took on the sponsorship entirely for this session, so I, I thank them very much. What I'm gonna do over the next uh, little bit is talk a little bit about delivery of oligonucleotides, the, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamic relationships and some of the things that we've learned over the years with for oligonucleotides, so that this being a workshop on making uh, drugs out of oligonucleotides, maybe some of the things that, if you're interested in making drugs out of oligonucleotides, you can go back and think about, and um, on how to apply some of these things uh, for your own programs. So, um, what I'm gonna do over the next little bit is, first of all, is provide some background on the distribution and the cellular uptake of um, oligonucleotides, single and double-stranded oligonucleotides. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about systemic applications of single-stranded oligonucleotides and discuss a concept I came up with called Tier 1 and Tier 2 tissues and the influence of medicinal chemistry on, on our ability to practice antisense pharmacology. I then want to move in from systemic to local routes of delivery. Can we deliver these drugs locally to the various tissues and cell types and how can that help? And I want to touch on CNS, pulmonary, ocular, and other um, applications and then a few take-home messages. So why is the understanding of oligonucleotide distribution important for drug discovery? It's obvious. You have to get your drug to your target cell and you need to get your drug to the target cell at sufficient quantities to elicit a pharmacological effect, right? It's obvious. Not so easy with oligonucleotides, and we had to learn a great deal over the 25, 30 years we've been doing this um, to make these into drugs. What are some of the basic questions? Do oligos um, get into cells when they're administered systemically without delivery tricks, without facilitated delivery, without transfection or conjugation? The answer is clearly yes, they do, but only some do. Some require facilitated delivery in order to get them into cells and produce a pharmacological effect. Do oligonucleotides distribute broadly when in, administered systemically, subcutaneously or intravenously? And they absolutely do get into cells um, broadly, but there are exceptions. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. They don't cross the blood-retinal barrier, so they won't go into the eye. And the distribution is not even, and that'll be a main focus of my presentation, is how do they distribute and how does that impact pharmacodynamic activity? Do, do, do oligonucle does oligon oligonucleotide uptake correlate quantitatively with activity? And it usually does, but not always. Clearly, there are cells that take up oligonucleotides avidly, and it's very hard to show a pharmacological effect with antisense or single strand or double stranded oligonucleotides. So, usually, but not always. And can local routes of delivery be exploited for RNA therapeutics? And the answer is absolutely yes. And it's a I, I think it's one of the most exciting areas for RNA therapeutics. It can render difficult to target cell types approachable and can reach organ systems that are not approachable systemically. Okay, I need to start with a few definitions. Functional uptake versus non-functional uptake. Functional uptake um, re refers to the pool of oligo in cells that's sufficient to access the target RNA and elicit an effect for RNA binding. This is often some referred to as the productive compartment of oligonucleotide uptake. There's also the non-functional uptake, or sometimes referred to as the sink, where oligo goes to and is totally unproductive. It might be in lysosomes or other structures. It's not productive. Um, how can you produce functional uptake? Well, you can do this in mainly two ways. You, you can add them to the cells freely, and they get into the cells, and they elicit, a, and they elicit an effect um, freely, without transfection, without delivery vehicles. We refer to this as free uptake, if you will, activity without delivery. Another, or you can elicit uh, functional uptake by facilitating delivery, transfection or conjugation strategies, nanoparticles, and so forth and so on. This slide shows an example of the compartment um, 
uh, ideas that I, that I laid out just a second ago. This slide shows in um, a single-stranded phosphatide oligonucleotide distributed in a rat kidney. Brown is uh, staining for oligonucleotide using an antibody by immunohistochemistry. And what you can see is that oligonucleotide is widely distributed in the rat kidney, particularly in the proximal tubular epithelial cells, a little bit in the glomeruli and so forth. But when you look at an electron mic micrograph, you actually can see that the majority of the oligonucleotide is contained within vesicular structures and is not available to binding to RNA. And that's shown on this slide here, where you can see oligonucleotide in these vesicles is obviously not very useful. It's not going to find the RNA in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, but you could also see that there's oligonucleotide, which appears to be diff diffuse. It, it appears to be free of, the, of these structures and presumably is available for binding to RNA. And presumably, that's what elicits their pharmacological effects um, in cells. And that's the productive versus the non-productive compartment, at least um, uh, from a visual standpoint um, that I was referring to. Now, oligonucleotides, single-stranded oligonucleotide phosphorothioates, can actually get into cells pretty well um, when just put, out, put on cells in, in cell culture um, without transfection. Um, this slide shows, I know it's very busy, but the point, I'll just walk you through it, the point is that this is um, an antisense oligonucleotide that we've been working on in an oncology program in which we just put them on a broad range of different cell lines in culture freely without transfection breast cancers, colon cancers, multiple myeloma, ovarian, and so forth and so on. What you can see in green are IC50s that actually show that these, these molecules are taken up well, and they can elicit a pretty good IC50, pretty good knockdown for the target in this case, and others shown in white where the IC50s are much higher. So some of the cells, some cell types um, can, most cell types can take up oligonucleotides, single-stranded phosphatide oligos pretty well. Um, but there's a wide range of sensitivities with respect to IC50s, and it's irrelevant. It's regardless of the type of tumor in this case or the type of cell type. And we can get into why this is in another time, but the point is, is that free uptake can be produced with single-stranded phosphatidylate oligonucleotides. This slide shows um, that same oligonucleotide, the same target. It's a second-generation phosphorothioate single-stranded oligonucleotide that works by an RNA-SH mechanism of action. Um, in which we transfected either a Gen 2.5 molecule, um, I'm sorry, this is a, uh, a constrained ethyl modification, a Gen 2.5 phosphorothioate molecule. It's the same for Gen 2, or very similar for Gen 2, compared to a double-stranded siRNA against this target, which you can see very nice activity when it's transfected. But when you look below, by free uptake, you can see that only the single-stranded oligonucleotide can elicit an effect. It's, it's, it doesn't require facilitated uptake, but the double-stranded molecules do. And that's not surprising. This is a slide that Mano just showed. And, and for exactly the reasons that Mano illustrated, it's probably not surprising that double-stranded molecules and single-stranded molecules have different properties when it comes to pharmacokinetics and distribution and uptake. And as Mano pointed out, these molecules differ in their rigidity on uh, single-stranded being a little bit more flexible than double-stranded molecules, and, their hydro and, and the amount of hydrophobicity that's exposed to, this, to, the, um, to the outside, whereas the heterocycles in a double-stranded are buried deeply, um, whereas the heterocycles in a single-stranded molecule are obviously freely exposed. And we know hydrophobicity is very important for cell uptake. So not surprisingly, um, the uptake properties, as I showed you freely in cell culture, can di differ a lot. And as Mano also showed, um, uh, this is also holds in vivo, where the RNAi type strategies generally require facilitated uptake for delivery. Um, Mano talked about lipid nanoparticles uh, as, as one um, approach, or conjugation strategies, such as utilizing Galmax strategies against the acyl glycoprotein receptor. And when you take these strategies, not always, but pr predominantly, it involves liver targeting. Whereas single-stranded phosphorothioate backbone-containing molecules can be administered, formulated in simple saline solution, injected, and they can distribute broadly, and they can do their thing in cells, just like they can do in cell culture. So it's very important to keep in mind um, when thinking about different modalities, different platforms, how you're going to deliver them. One re requiring facilitated delivery, one maybe requiring not, um, non, um, free, free, free uptake. I don't want to get into this slide. It's very busy. It just really talks a little bit about the mechanisms of a single-stranded ASO uptake. 
Um, uh, um, this really isn't a talk on the mechanisms. We could talk about it later, but just to, just to summarize, free uptake activity can be demonstrated against a broad range of cell types. Single-stranded ASOs are readily taken up by most cells. Uh, the medicinal chemistry, the structure really matters, double-stranded versus single-stranded, so forth and so on. And I think I touched the rest on this about productive versus non-productive uptake and so on. So for the remainder of my talk, what I want to focus on is single-stranded phosphorothioate-containing oligonucleotides and how we can utilize them for making drugs out of oligonucleotides. This is a slide is an autoradiograph um, in a rat. Um, in which we looked at the distribution of, an, of a second-generation oligonucleotide radio-labeled again, uh, and, and involving two cross-planes, two sections of the rat to look at different distribution. And what, you, what this is shows the distribution in, in different colors, um, with reds and yellows being the most intense, the greatest uptake in various organs, and greens, blues, and purples being less distribution. The first thing you see is that the distribution is broad. It's very broad. It gets pretty much everywhere throughout the animal except for the CNS. You don't see anything in the brain. But you also see that it's uneven. You can see that the kidney, for example, and the liver and the spleen take up a great deal of oligonucleotide, as do some other organs as well. Uh, the intestine see it being somewhere in the middle, the small and large intestine, and then the skeletal muscle in, in, the, in this color purple um, showing less. It's there. Um, but it's at much less quantities, quant um, concentrations, than is for the other organs. And obviously this is important um, uh, with respect to how do drugs work in different cell types and tissues. Now, um, a very important message I want to get across is that an organ should not be the focus when asking questions about uh, is, my, is my drug going to work um, against a cell type that I need to target? Because within every organ, of course, there are many different types of cells. This slide shows an example of in, in the liver, in which we fractionate the liver into parenchymal and non-parenchymal cells. Hepatocytes, parenchymal, non-parenchymal and endothelial cells, macrophage, Kufr cells, and so forth. And what you can see is actually the majority of the drug um, gets into the non-parenchymal section and some in, and, and also, but also a good portion in the hepatocytes. And you can look at this by, visually by using histochemistry as well. We can see hepatocyte uptake or endothelial cell uptake or Kupfer cell uptake and so on. Um, different cell types take up oligonucleotides differently, even within an organ. And this can result in different differential effects for target knockdown using an RNA-SH mechanism. Um, in the liver, um, at higher doses, we can clearly see activity in all these compartments, in most of these compartments, such as the hepatocytes. This is an in situ hybridization in which we're looking at target knockdown of a non-coding RNA called MALLET1, shown in red in the nucleus. And you can see we can pretty much knock out uh, MALLET1 in all cell types in the liver, but there are exceptions, such as the bile duct epithelial cells, where we, which is refractory to an antisense effect. So not all cell types are created equally. And I, what I could also tell you is that if you did a detailed dose response curve and looked at the effects in parenchymal versus non-parenchymal cells, the hepatocytes are much more sensitive than the non-parenchymal macrophages and endothelial cells, despite the fact that I showed you just a moment ago that more gets into the non-parenchymal cells. The non-parenchymal cells tend to practice more non-productive non uptake. They sequester the oligonucleotides, but you can still show an effect at higher doses. So, systemic applications. What are the most sensitive tissues? What are the most sensitive cell types that we have found? Clearly the liver, but specifically the hepatocyte. Mm -hmm. The kidney, but specifically the renal proximal tubular epithelial cells in the kidney. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the adipocyte. In the, in the adipose tissue. And the adipose tissue also has different types of cells, very important. But what we've, been able, what we've learned is that the adipocyte is very sensitive to antisense effects. And obviously, understanding these effects has allowed us to build drug discovery programs, knowing where the, what the most sensitive cell types are. This is an old slide that I prepared years ago, um, uh, looking at the effects, antisense knockdown in a mouse in these three most sensitive cell types, liver, kidney, and adipose tissue in a mouse, subcutaneously administered phosphorothioate second generation molecule. And you can see regardless of the target, regardless of the function of the target, we can knock down the targets very nicely in duplicate animals compared to saline controls um, in liver, adipose tissue, and kidney. These are very sensitive cell, 
very sensitive organs. And these effects are dose dependent. You can see here, this happens to be a target um, of tremendous interest um, in our programs today, showing uh, targeting a second generation molecule targeting factor 11, a coagulation factor that's produced specifically in hepatocytes. You see it's a very nice dose dependent knockdown, very good specificity. We knock the protein down, we knock the activity down, and it works great in humans too, similar effects. Um, uh, this drug is now in phase two development. This is phase one data showing dose-dependent knockdown in a, in, against these hepatocytes um, over the course of about 36 days. And then you see a long duration of effect because the drug is very stable against nuclease degradation. Um, the point is, is that hepatocytes are very sensitive. I think you all know that. But the other point is that, again, this is administered in simple saline solution. You don't require the facilitated uptake. That's um, for at least hepatocytes. And Mano talked uh, uh, extensively about um, Galmax strategies uh, utilizing the acyl-glycoprotein receptor, and he also mentioned that it's also applicable for single-stranded phosphorothioate-containing oligonucleotides as it is for double-stranded oligonucleotides, and that's indeed the case. You can see here um, a, a hepatocyte-specific target, a lipoprotein in mouse called APOC3 which is very effective by itself in, for knockdown of the APOC3 messenger RNA protein and, its, and the pharmacological consequence of that, inhibiting triglyceride production. But when you galnac this structure, you can improve the potency on the order of, depending on your design, 10, 20-fold improvement in potency as well. So you can utilize, um, even though your molecules can work through non-facilitated delivery in vivo, you can still make them better with a, with a targeting um, type of strategy. I mentioned before about differential distribution in organs. Um, again, different cell types within an organ are different. They're going to take up oligonucleotide differently, and they're going to ex exhibit different differential sensitivity. And the kidney is no different. I already said that the tier one, that the kidney is a tier one tissue. It's very sensitive to antisense effects, but it too has differential distribution. If you look at the distribution of a phosphorothioate containing oligonucleotide in a mouse kidney, you could, you could see a, a marked difference between the cortex distribution and the medulla. The medulla is where the loops of Henle are, the collecting ducts, whereas the, in the cortex, of course, are the proximal tubular epithelial cells and also some distal tubules and the glomeruli. You can see that the proximal tubules are extremely sensitive to, well, uptake. Um, as, and you could see a fair amount in the glomerulus as well, uh, not nearly as much as the RPTs, not much in the distal tubules. So you, by designing a drug discovery program focused on where the drug goes, you can be successful. This is a target that we've worked on over the years in our diabetes program called SGLT2 that is expressed exclusively in the renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. And not surprisingly, we can show remarkable potency for knockdown in a rat or in a mouse, well, rats too, um, dose-dependent knockdown in, for SGLT2 in renal proximal tubular epithelial cells. And I can also tell you that when we've tried to target, um, um, when, we, when we've gone after targets in the collecting tubules, like the vasopressin receptor, totally unsuccessful. We were not able, with generation two chemistry, to be able to target the vasopressin receptor because it's in the medulla, it's in the collecting tubules. So very important to know where your drug is going. Okay. Tier one tissues, how do we work beyond tier one tissues? How do we continue to expand antisense pharmacology, knowing what we know? And so for example, how can we go beyond liver, kidney, and fat? How can we work in oncology? How can we work in the heart, muscle, bone marrow, GI, what have you, and so forth and so on? Well, that's where medicinal chemistry has come to the rescue again. Um, medicinal chemistry um, really enabled the, the entirety of RNA therapeutics um, over the years, and generation two chemistries and the chemistries that, have, that Mano talked about for double-stranded oligonucleotides have really enabled this all to work. And, gen two, and now new chemistries have enabled us to go beyond tier one tissues. One ke chemistry that Mano talked about was this generation 2.5 chemistry, which is, a, which is a bicyclic nucleic acid, bicyclic nucleic acid chemistry called constrained ethyl. And what I want to focus on, in addition to improving potency in tier one tissues, 
it ha greatly expands the range of targets and tissues and cell types that we can practice antisense pharmacology in, particularly single-stranded phosphothioate containing oligonucleotides. This slide um, shows some work um, that we've done over the years uh, with, a sec with a generation 2.5 molecule targeting STAT3 in a tumor xenograft model. The results are obvious. Gener at this dose, at the dose we're providing here in this xenograft model, you can see no knockdown for a Gen2 molecule, a 2 prime mo gapmer, an optimized 2 prime mo gapmer, versus a Gen2.5 molecule, um, uh, which shows remarkable activity in a tumor xenograft as well, um, and, and, and also by immunohistochemistry. I skipped ahead a little quick. This is a collage, an example of different um, uh, um, activities in which we've looked at Gen 2.5 chemistry against tier two tissues. Um, you can see shown here is the data I just showed you in a tumor xenograph where we show remarkable knockdown in a xenograph model. Free uptake in cell culture also reflects greater potency. Um, but also in skeletal muscle, where we could see remarkable acti improved activity with a Gen 2.5 molecule versus Gen 2. Of course, this is all dose dependent. We're gonna hear talks today, even in our afternoon session and throughout the meeting that we can target muscle with earlier generation chemistries, Gen 2 molecules or Gen 2 like molecules, but it's all based on the dose response. Depends on the dose you use. How do you have to go to higher doses? Or how high do you have to go to show an effect? So you can, see, you can see effects with Gen 2 molecules, but clearly we have greater potency in muscle compared to with Gen 2.5 molecules versus Gen 2. So this has been a big breakthrough. Another example is bone marrow, where we see remarkable differences in activity with these Gen 2.5 molecules. This is some data that uh, Gene Hung published from my group in nucleic acid therapeutics, showing the activity in all kinds of different tissues with Gen 2.5 versus Gen 2 in mice. Um, targeting a non-coding RNA called myelot one I know this is impossible to read, so I'll just tell you what it says. Um, showing the activity in muscle. You can see marked improvements in activity, I hope you can see, in efficacy, um, uh, and also in the lung, in the adrenal gland, in the gallbladder, heart tissue, cardiac myocytes, and also in other muscles like the diaphragm. So we can Go, we can expand the, t the types of targets, the tissues we can practice antisense pharmacology in by using new chemistries, generation 2.5 chemistry. And the key here is the potency that we get from these molecules. Because as I showed you before, distribution is broad, but the amount of drug that gets into some tissues, like muscle, is much less than what gets into, say, liver. And therefore, if you can improve the potency of your molecules and also affect the, f the free, the productive distribution of your molecules, a little bit from the non-productive compartment to the productive compartment, you can have remarkable improvements. Okay, what I wanna now just finish up with is local delivery. A tier one tissue systemic, tier two tissue systemic applications, but what about uh, these other tissues? Um, Mano already talked about vitravine, a first generation molecule that was administered to the eye intravitreally. As I mentioned, these drugs do not cross the blood retinal barrier following systemic administration, but they work great in the eye. CNS, lung by aerosol, skin, GI locally to the GI tract. We'll touch on some of this. Um, I, actually, what I'm gonna touch mostly on are um, I, lung, and CNS. I want to do mention wanna, that on Wednesday we have a presentation in our conference by Celgene, which are going to be talking about oral local application of a phosphatite molecule for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. So stay tuned for that. CNS, I think. So starting with CNS, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, tr these drugs do not cross the blood brain barrier, but if you administer them, if you get them into the CNS, single-stranded phosphothioate containing oligonucleotides, they work remarkably well. Um, and not only do they work remarkably well throughout the cord in the brain, um, they're very stable in the CNS. So we can administer these drugs, we think, maybe twice a year or so, a single bolus injection. And we're, and we're gonna hear a lot about these programs um, um, during the conference this year, so stay tuned for that, including an update on the um, drug that Mono talked a little bit about, the drug for spinal muscular atrophy that's in phase three development. 
This slide just shows activity in a large animal, a pig, following intrathecal delivery of a second generation molecule, um, targeting Huntington, the Huntington gene. Uh, showing very nice knockdown of target at this dose at the mRNA level, grants many different t tissue types, cell types in the brain, um, and, the, and the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationship is really excellent. You can see the relationship here amongst the various tissues. So you can make you can render the CNS sensitive by delivering the drug to electric, directly to the CNS. What about the lung? Well. Um, as I showed you before with Gen 2.5 molecules, you can get some activity in the lung following systemic administration, but it really works well if you deliver them air by aerosol. These drugs aerosolize very well. They get into different cell types, diff deeply into the lung, and we could practice antisense pharmacology very nicely in this, in this, in using this route. This slide shows the distribution um, in lung epithelial cells following aerosol delivery and the knockdown of a target, MALLET1, that we routinely use to characterize pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic activities. Staining here, this is RT-PCR showing excellent knockdown in whole lung. Now, as I've been emphasizing th throughout this talk, an organ isn't an organ isn't an organ. You really need to th think about the cell types within those organs and what are the most sensitive cell types in those organs. And this type of approach that we've done in the lung is the same approach that we've done in the liver and in the kidney and in new organs that we're working on today, in which we don't just say, is the, activity, is it, is the drug active in the lung? What cell types is it active in the lung? So we've done fractionation in the lung following aerosol delivery, identifying fractions um, that contain the air, airway epithelial cells, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, macrophages, goblet cells, mucus producing cells, and so on ciliated cells and said, what are the most sensitive cell types? And we've fully characterized these cell types. Um, and we steer our drug discovery programs to those sense cell types that are most sensitive. This is one example. This data, is, some of this data is gonna be presented by Xu Ling Guo here at the conference um, uh, this week in which um, we've taken advantage of our understanding that airway epithelial cells and goblet cells that are relevant to cystic fibrosis and other types of fibrosis in the lung are very sensitive to, to these molecules when delivered by aerosol. This is a target we're very excited about called the um, epithelial sodium channel, um, drug, a target for cystic fibrosis, which you can see very nice activity in this fraction of cells that contains the airway epithelial cells that that this target is expressed in, and you'll see in the poster, remarkable activity in models of cystic fibrosis, mucus production, um, reversing mucus production, and so forth and so on. What's next? How about the eye? We've already heard about vitravine administered to the eye. Administering these drugs to the eye, but let me just say before I say that, is the first, vitravine, when it was approved, it was the first ever intravitreally uh, administered drug, period. Today, is, is intravitreal administered drugs is a routine procedure in an ophthalmologist's office or other places. Um, and, um, but yet, yeah, the Antisense platform was the first ever to do a clinical trial using intravitreal routes. Today we know about Lucentis and other drugs. Well, they have outstanding drug-like properties when administered to the eye. Uh, they have, they're, they're distributed broadly. They have a long half-life, low systemic exposure, so you don't have to worry about off-target toxicities systemically. Um, very nice activity in large and small animals have been demonstrated, and, and I think I said good tolerability. This slide shows the distribution. Um, again, it's staining in the inner nuclear layer, the outer nuclear layer, and their um, retinal pigmented epithelial cells. Brown staining is ASO. Very nice staining throughout all these layers in the back of the eye in a mouse, and then in a rabbit, following a single intravitreal injection, you can see a very long half-life on the order of, of more than a month. Again, these drugs can be administered probably twice a year, maybe at least once, a, at most once a quarter. And of course, there are many eye diseases that have tremendous unmet medical needs. Uh, this slide shows in the eye, again, targeting mallet one, um, showing the knockdown. I showed you the, the distribution of the pharmacokinetics. This slide shows by in situ hybridization, the knockdown in, the in all these cell layers here, the ganglion cell layers, or the inner nuclear layer, the outer nuclear layer, very nice knockdown by in situ hybridization or by RT-PCR. This is another target um, following intravitreal administration, SRB1 in a mouse, following a, a single administration. What you can see is the long duration of action because it has a long 
uh, has a high stability in the eye, long tissue half-life. So we can administer this drug maybe once a quarter, most frequently. And you'll see a, um, a poster if, um, during the conference by Sue Murray, who will be talking about um, one application for the prevention of a genetic disease that causes blindness. Oops. Okay, so to wrap up, um, summary, um, what I tried to, I tried to make a few points, some of the take home messages. Um, first, understanding how um, oligonucleotides distribute and what the most sensitive cell types are is essential for all oligonucleotide based RNA therapeutics, what organs, what cell types within those organs. Something I didn't talk about is the influence of the disease process, and that's something to keep in mind. An inflamed organ has a different distribution than a non inflamed organ, for example. The distribution properties of oligonucleotides, um, single and double stranded um, oligonucleotides, are different. Um, and even for the most sensitive cell types, the bulk of oligonucleotide that's in a cell is probably unproductive. Uh, for single stranded oligos with phosphothiolate backbones, the most sensitive organs and cell types are well defined. We'll call them tier one. They can be improved with GALMAC type strategies, if you will, or other types of strategies. And then tier two tissues can be approached with new chemistries that make that render them more sensitive. And then last, the local, local routes of an antisense oligonucleotide delivery um, can be utilized that achieve um, remarkable activity for, against cell types that are may not be approachable using the systemic route. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>